So, better get started. Uh, crossing the river by feeling the stones. Uh, this is what we're going to go through. I'm going to talk about the issue of strategy. So this is going to be a long, long way away from development. I'm going to talk about the issue of strategy. Then we'll talk about maps and why maps are important for this. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, common economic patterns of change. And hopefully, if I've got time at the end, I'm going to wrap this all together and, and use this to explain servants. Uh, are you all using servants? Yes. yes. Who, who's, who's more on the serverless side? Who's on the container side? Oh. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So we've got lots of legacy in the room. Fantastic, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to start talking about the issue of uh, strategy. Um, I'm going to start with a uh, company that I used to work with. Uh, it's called Fatango. Uh, this is uh, uh, Fatango back in 2003. A relatively small company, um, 16 different lines of business, about 10 million users across those different lines of business, so okay for 2003. Uh, very profitable, revenue was growing, uh, but it had a big problem. And the big problem uh, was, was this person, the CEO, otherwise known as the fat cat. Um, the problem with the CEO was they were a fake CEO. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. Now I know this because I was the CEO. <laughs> I was making it all up as I went along. It didn't matter, revenue was growing, very profitable, but I, I was worried that eventually people would sort of rumble uh, that I didn't have a clue. And we had, uh, you know, I wasn't sort of the chess playing master that you read about in HBR, I was more the sort of alchemist. Now we had vision statements, things like this, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, so back in 2000, well, I started with XP Extreme Programming. You all know what XP is, I assume. Yeah, good back in 1999. Uh, we'd adopted it throughout the company in 2002. By 2003, 2004, we discovered it didn't work everywhere. Uh, we were heavy users of open source and providers of open source. I used to do a lot of sponsorship of the Pearl community. Anybody from Pearl? Fantastic, right, super. Uh, anyway, so um, uh, the problem with this vision statement is I'd literally pinched it from another company and changed a few words. So, um, <laughs> so, so I, I was worried people would discover. So I used to go around uh, conferences recording other, uh, other execs teaking, talking about strategy. I used to look for what I call business level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. So these are the common words that people would use. Uh, and I've done this every couple of years. Uh, this was 2014. Here are the common BLAS, digital business, uh, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive. If I did it today, what words would you hear? AI, 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 yes. Blockchain, you've got to have a bit of blockchain. Excellent, what else? IoT. Oh, absolutely, IoT. Um, so, so I went around grabbing people's strategy documents and from this created the Blah template. Uh, our strategy is Blah. We will lead a Blah effort of the market through our use of Blah and Blah to build a Blah. And then I combined the Blahs and the Blah template, smashed them together, and also magically generated 64 random strategies. <laughs> Things like this. Uh, our strategy is customer focus. Remember, this is complete gibberish. Uh, we will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is number two. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a great effort of the market. Through, I can barely say the words, it's that pain. So I sent them around. I got 400 responses. Three basic types. Uh, number one, this is the exact wording for our business plan. <laughs> uh, number two was, I've seen two of these used already. And, and the third of my favorites was, are you for hire? <laughs> So a friend of mine has now put this all online. Uh, this is strategy as a service. If you ever need a strategy, you just type in the URL. It will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. If you like, you can pretend there's blockchain and AI behind it and all the rest of it, and whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, if you don't like the strategy, it's really simple. Just press refresh, and, uh, and there you are. So that's the end of my talk. That's the entire field of strategy discussed in the modern day. Um, so, 
back in 2004, 2005, I started to think, um, well, I didn't know what I was doing and I couldn't find anybody else who seemed to know what they were doing either. I thought they were just keeping it secret from me. So I went back to first principles. Um, I started off with Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? The Art of War. Perfect. Talked about five factors that mattered in competition. The first one is purpose, uh, your moral imperative. Uh, the second one is understand your landscape, the environment you're competing in. So you've got a purpose, you now understand your landscape. The third one is understand the climactic patterns that are impacting that landscape. Uh, then you need to understand doctrine, so universal principles of organisation. And finally you get into the leadership bit, which is all about strategy and context specific forms of gameplay. Now I was quite excited by that, and then I came across uh, John Boyd. Anybody heard of John Boyd? Pilot. Pilot, US Air Force. <coughs> Do you know what he created? Uh, OODA loops. Uh, OODA loops. So, but, uh, popular with Trump, unfortunately. Um, so, you've got the game purpose. The next step is to observe the environment. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. Observing the environment around you. Then you orientate yourself around this. Uh, with doctrine, and then you decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. Now, I was quite excited by this. I would share it with others, and they would say, yeah, it's all nonsense. Uh, strategy is all about the importance of why. The problem with this statement is there are two whys. There's the why of purpose, and there's the why of movement. And these are very, very different things. So if you think of a, um, like a game of chess, the why of purpose might be to win the game. The why of movement is do I move this piece over that piece? And it's through movement and action that we actually learn. So by moving the piece, we learn forms of gameplay. So I went back to Fatango. I said, right, what's our purpose? Well, our purpose, given the fact that I would written it and created, helped create the company, was a mess. It was all over the place. We had 16 different lines of business. But, but that's okay. It's a cycle. As we go around it, we'll get better. So how do we understand or observe the landscape? So this brings me on to a subject known as situational awareness. And I'm going to use a couple of examples. Uh, the first of Vikings. These are uh, very frightening people. Uh, this is how Vikings used to navigate. From Herman, head due west towards half, you will have sailed north of Hatland. They used to use stories. So before you were put in charge of your boat, you'd spend years and years and years learning epic stories, and those epic stories were actually for navigation. Now, that's what that epic story, that was a part of that epic story, that's what that epic story actually means. So I've got a question for you. What would you use to navigate? A visual map or a verbal story? Yeah? Do you all agree? Well, you see, if I'm giving somebody directions up the road, I might use a verbal story. So go up the road, turn left, turn right, etc., etc. If I'm trying to organize troop movements for 10,000 people, I am not going to use a verbal story to get that done. Uh, unless my intention is to kill people, uh, as in my own people, uh, I, I'm going to use maps. Okay, so here's another example, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem, the Persians were invading. Now what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians, there are about 170,000 Persians, along the coastal road into Thermopylae, it's a narrow pass, where a small number of troops could <coughs> defend against a larger force. Now approximately, uh, there were 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. Spartans. You know the story of the 300. Fantastic. Okay, I want you to imagine you're members of the Athenian army. It's the eve of battle. I'm giving you purpose and moral imperative. We're going to defend against the invading Persian hordes. But then I say to you, I do not understand the landscape. I do not understand the environment. I have no map. But have no fear, for I have created a swap diagram. 
<laughs> Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the ephors might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians. Get rid of the Spartans, we're actually Athenian, we hate the Spartans, and the threat to the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. Okay, so what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement on a map, or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram? Yeah? Right, what do we use in business? SWOT. Excellent. Right. So I'm now going to go back to chess and uh, alchemy. So if I look at chess and alchemy and look at navigation, learning and strategy, then chess, uh, navigation is visual. It's the board. Learning is context specific. It's the game at hand because we have a visualization of the board. Uh, strategy is all about position and movement. It's what we call high level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, you know, why did you bomb that hill? They won't say because I read an article in General Weekly that bombing hills was the latest thing. <laughs> they won't tell you that I've got some consultant report saying 67% of other generals are bombing hills, therefore we should bomb a hill. And, and, and they're not going to tell you, oh, bomb the hill because that's what Uber would do. <laughs> it's all about position and movement. Okay? Now, unfortunately, alchemy is all about storytelling, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. It's a low-level situational awareness environment. It is all about, you know, you know, reading a report saying, you know, other generals are doing, not bombing, doing AI. Therefore, you know, 67% of other companies are doing AI. Therefore, you should do AI. It's that sort of stuff. And we do like our magic frameworks and secrets of success. This is my favorite article from Harvard Business Review. It's November 2011, so it's not an April Fool's. It's all about how earlobes can signify leadership potential. It's, it's phrenology of management. It's outcome ba bias writ large. I mean, uh, I always suggest to people, just grab your CEO, pin them to the ground, measure their earlobe, and then tell them, we'll see, see what happens. Anyway, so. That's where I was. That's where my organization was. I was in that alchemy side, but I'm still making money. Very profitable. But I wanted to be over there. And the difference between the two environments is simply the existence or non-existence of a map. So what is a map? Well, maps have certain characteristics. They're a subset of graphs. But the characteristics that they have are you have an anchor. So in the case of a geographical map, it's magnetic north. You have the position of pieces relative to an anchor. So this is north, south, east, or west of that. You also have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Thebes to Thermopylae, which direction would I go? Northwest. If I went northwest from Thebes and ended up in Athens, what would that tell me? Either the map's wrong or the compass is wrong. Okay? And if I move a piece, it changes the context. You see, in a map, space has meaning. So it's not like a, a typical sort of a, a graph diagram of, uh, of various nodes and connections between them where you can move them around and it doesn't make a real difference. In a map, space has very precisely meaning. So this is the sort of maps that I had, systems maps. So for example, customer requires photo storage, etc. Now if I take a component like CRM and I move that component, how has that map changed? It hasn't. If I shift Australia in a geographical map and put it next to the UK, does that change that map? Do you know why it doesn't change this map? Because it's not a map. Absolutely. Space has no meaning here. It doesn't have those basic characteristics of anchor, position, and movement. In fact, every single thing I had in business, business process maps, uh, mind maps, 
all sorts of different other things called maps. Do you know what they all have in common? Uh, yes, we keep on using that word, and I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. None of them are actually maps. So this is the problem that I had in 2005. So how to map? So I took a systems diagram and said the first thing I need is an anchor. So when I'm doing maps these days, I'll often have multiple anchors, uh, users, government, you know, various industry at the top. But you put an anchor at the top. So in this case, customer. Now those customers have needs. And those needs have components which themselves have needs. So what you can do is create a chain of needs. Now that gives you anchor and position from those things which are visible to the customers to those things which still matter but are invisible. You also need movement. And the way to do movement is to add an evolution axis. So there is a common pattern by which different forms of capital, whether activities, practices, data, or knowledge, evolve. And for activities, we call it genesis, custom-built product, and commodity utility. So that was the first map that I did in 2005. In this map, space has meaning. And so what? Why does any of that stuff matter? But it gets onto patterns. If you can understand the landscape, then you can start to observe climactic patterns. Um, these are the rules that influence the game. And there's 30 of them that I'm aware of. Most people are oblivious to pretty much all of them. The first one is everything evolves. If there is supply and demand competition, it doesn't matter what it is, money, penicillin, or computing starts on the left, ends up on the right. The second pattern you learn is characteristics change. So on the left-hand side, it doesn't again matter whether it's computing, money, or whatever, it starts off in this uncharted space, chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable. It evolves through a second set of characteristics until it eventually ends up being industrialized. Ordered, standard, stable, dull, boring. Now for me, back in 2005, that was important. And it was important because we had discovered that XP doesn't work everywhere. And what we realized is things like extreme programming were very good on the left-hand side uh, because it focuses on reducing the cost of change, whereas things like Six Sigma and outsourcing are very good on the right-hand side and because they focus on reducing deviation, and things in the middle, well, these days you probably use Scrum, MVP, etc., because you're focused on learning and reducing waste. So we learned back in 2005 that you need three different, at least three different techniques to manage something. So you learn no one size fits all. So here's an example, HS2, High Speed Rail, Heavy Engineering Project, that's James Finley, uh, CIO of HS2. Uh, this is the systems diagram for building HS2 in a virtual world. Uh, James' problem was this one. Should he outsource the whole lot, which was the past government practice? Should we build with off-the-shelf products? Or should we build in-house with agile techniques? Or should we use some sort of magic combination of all three? Now the problem with using the magic combination of all three is even in that simple diagram, there are 387 million permutations. So how do you pick the right one? So he sat down, had a cup of tea in his garden, and drew a map. And once you have a map, it's pretty simple. Because the stuff you do on the right-hand side, you tend to outsource, or if you're going to build yourself, you use Six Sigma. The stuff you do in the middle, you use off-the-shelf products, or if you're building yourself, you use something like Lean. And the stuff on the left-hand side, you'll build in-house with Agile techniques. Now, because we know that other pattern, that everything evolves, we also know those, those uh, techniques will change as those components evolve. So use appropriate methods. That's actually an example of doctrine. We'll come to doctrine in a minute. But I'll give you an example here. Anybody from finance? Nobody? Right. OK, I used to work in finance as well as engineering. Um, I'm going to pretend you're all from finance. And I'm IT, OK? Which basically means most things in IT seem a bit elvish to you. So I'm going to talk about um, self-driving car. And what I've done is I've taken a simple systems diagram for a self-driving car and translated it into Elvish, your finance. So I want to collaborate. I want to work together. So I need your advice. 
Do you think we should outsource or build our own A? What do you think? <laughs> I, I, I want to work, we want to get collaboration between IT and the business. <coughs> no? Okay. I'm going to exactly the same diagram, that's the mapping version. I'll ask you that question again. Should we outsource or build our own A? Outsource. Should we outsource or build our own B? Okay, and turn it back. Unfortunately, we didn't try and build our own GPS system, except for the UK is obviously trying to build its own GPS system. That's another conversation. Okay, the point about this is context matters. So, what do you use these 30 economic patterns for? And remember, I've just mentioned two to you. Uh, it's pretty simple. I use them for prediction, or anticipation, I should say. So, back in 2005, we had a map. We knew that compute and platform um, would end up as a utility. Uh, we actually knew we'd have inertia to change. That's one of the other common economic patterns, uh, is that we have inertia to pass success. So for example, who was first with um, a website? Blockbuster or Netflix? Good, who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, Blockbuster. great. Who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster. Perfect, Blockbuster. Right, who went bankrupt first? <laughs> okay, it's got nothing to do with lack of innovation. It had everything to do with the fact that they had um, uh, past success created by late fees. Their business model actually restricted them. So we know that things were going to evolve. We know we'd have inertia. We, we know there's an effect called componentization uh, that will enable new sources of value of worth. And the point about this is now we can see there's multiple points that we can attack. Should we invest here, 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 or here? Okay. So the next set of patterns you learn are doctrine. Now these are universally applicable principles regardless of context. So what you've got is there's about 30 common economic patterns and they will impact your landscape regardless of what you do. But that's useful for anticipating change. Then you've got a whole bunch of patterns you can apply. 40 of them turn out to be universally useful, so you should always apply them. Uh, about 100 of them turn out to be context specific. So that's more gameplay. Now, of course, I'm not going to go through all these patterns. Um, I'll start with simple ones. Uh, so for example, in doctrine, a simple pattern is what is the user need? Focus on the user need. So we did a lot of this within UK government. Surprisingly, it turns out to be universally useful if you're building something to actually think about what the user needs. That was a bit of a shock to people in 2008, 2009, but uh, there we are. Another one is use appropriate methods. So you don't try doing the tyranny of Agile or the tyranny of Six Sigma or the tyranny of outsourcing. You use multiple methods at the same time. Of course, that assumes you understand the landscape. Another one, and I'm only going to do three, is to challenge assumptions. So this is a really simple example. Uh, one group uh, has a job. Its job is to give account to another department. So their customer is this department, and what they want is account. They give them a monthly figure. And they get this figure uh, from weighing machines. So what they've got is stuff comes into goods in, uh, they weigh the stuff, uh, they get a number, they put it into their computer system, and at the end of the month they give account. And what they wanted to do was a digitization program. They wanted to replace all the weighing machines with digital weighing machines um, and connect them to the system. It was going to cost them a few million. So the first thing I asked is, what are you weighing? And they were weighing paper forms. Uh, why are you weighing paper forms? Because it's easier to weigh and calculate the number of paper forms than it is to actually physically count them, because that, the, the volume is so large. OK. Where are you getting the paper forms from? Well, they come in from goods in through various distribution sites, which are all over the country. Great. So you go talk to a distribution site. Where are you getting your paper forms from? Well, we print them out. We print them out and we send them, because that's our job, is to set, print out these forms and send them to goods in, this other group. Ah, so you have delivery agents and purchasing, etc. Right. And where are you getting the data for printing those forms out? Well, that comes from our CRM system. <laughs> And where's that data coming from? Well, it comes from our website where users fill online the forms. Right, so your users are filling online forms, yes, and you're printing them out and sending them to this other department, yes, and every, please, 
We've got multiple of these distribution set sites all around the country, yes. And do you know what they're doing with those paper forms? No. They're weighing them to count the number of forms <laughs> that have been printed. This entire infrastructure could be replaced with site count staff and tables. <laughs> <laughs> the point about this is people aren't daft. They, they basically are maximizing uh, local variables, trying to make the local system as efficient as possible because no one sees the overall picture and no one is challenging the assumptions. So that's the third piece of doctrine you learn, <coughs> challenge assumptions. So does investing several million pounds replacing weighing scales with digital weighing scales as part of a digitization program make any sense at all? No. no. Good. Okay, so once you get past climactic patterns and doctrine, all this stuff, by the way, is Creative Commons. I made it Creative Commons 2005, you just help yourself. Um, then you get to the leadership bit. So these are the context-specific forms of gameplay. There's about a hundred of those. Again, most people are oblivious to all of these. So what you've got is a map of the environment. Uh, you apply climactic patterns. You can see where you can attack. We can discuss you know, what components are, are missing. We can challenge the assumptions. Remember, this is a map from 2005. So we can challenge the assumptions, etc. get agreement on this. And then what you learn is you can manipulate the map. You can use open approaches to accelerate things to a more industrialized state. You can use fear, uncertainty, and doubt, where people have inertia. You can use constraints. There's all sorts of ecosystem models that you can use to manipulate a space. So that's what we did. 2005, we used the map and realized that uh, somebody else was going to create computers a utility. Um, I actually thought it was going to be Google. It turned out to be Amazon the next year. Um, we would do a platform play. Uh, by that, we built an environment where you built entire applications front and back end in JavaScript, um, and we had billing per function, etc., all exposed through APIs. So, what you more call a serverless environment today. We anticipated somebody would do the utility play. We'd actually virtualized their entire data centers anyway, built on a, a Zen, which was built by friends of mine, Ian Pratt and Simon uh, from college. So, we um, uh, we were just expecting somebody else to play the game. We could move on to their environment. So as soon as Amazon launched in 2006, we did. Um, in terms of the next step, it's to act. And that's what we did. So we launched Zimki. Uh, you used to run around with pre-shaved yak t-shirts because uh, it's all about yak shaving and getting rid of it. And the speed of development was amazing. We saw changes of practices because people now had financial information about the function. And it started to grow, so we had somewhere in the region from the early betas about uh, 1,200 different development companies building all sorts of different applications. It was, uh, it was getting really rather good. Um, unfortunately, at the time, remember this is 2006, our parent company had a big American strategy consultancy firm come in and explain to us you know, the three things that we were doing, cloud, 3D printing, and the use of mobile phones as cameras was not the future. Uh, the future was, in fact, 3D television. So we should shut it all down and spend a billion dollars on 3D TV. Anybody here have a 3D TV? Right, anybody use one? <laughs> You're the first person ever. <laughs> I, I just, a billion dollars went on you, so. <laughs> um, so I decided, well, that's not for me. Uh, so, um, but the thing about the maps, is um, I started using it in 2005, I was learning from the maps in the way that I never learned from business models. I never went back and looked at past business models, swap diagrams and saw, saw what happened, but maps, I did this all the time. You'd have a map, you'd put your play down in that context, you'd go back and look at it, see what happened and how it's changed. And so I went to work for a friend of mine, Mark, um, at Canonical. Uh, they provide Ubuntu, you've all heard of Ubuntu? Right, so we were mapped out the environment in 2008. This is very much a simplification of that map uh, and use that map to attack the space. It cost me half a million and about 18 months. Um, we went from about 2% of the operating system market to 70% of all cloud computing. Does anybody remember that time? It was all Red Hat, Microsoft, Red Hat, Microsoft, and then in cloud, suddenly Ubuntu was everywhere. 
Anybody? One? A few? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then I um, wrote something called the Better for Less paper uh, with a friend of mine, Liam Maxwell. This is for, was for Francis Maud. I'm actually a member of the Labour Party, but um, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> it was all about changing IT uh, within government. This led to something called spend control and helped support the case for creating something called GDS, Government Digital Services. Uh, these days, uh, most of my mapping stuff that I do personally is more policy level, nation state competition, different industries, China versus USA. So sometimes mappings, you know, I, I, uh, have you all heard of Kelsey, Kelsey Hightower? Yeah. Right, well, Kelsey mapped himself, and as a result of mapping, he actually changed his job and left Core OS and, and now runs Kubernetes. <laughs> now, it is uh, a big part of the Kubernetes project. Um, so, anyway, um, it's used at all different levels. So, quick summary. Um, we talk about strategy maps and patterns. So we start off with, I had no strategy uh, because I didn't have a map. Uh, I created a way of mapping, which I've made Creative Commons. I assumed everybody else in the world had maps. I assume this is what people learned at MBAs. I now do one day a year at uh, Judge Business School, and I did one day last year uh, in Oxford, and one day last year in UCL. Uh, what I've subsequently discovered is no people haven't been using maps, which I found quite surprising. It took me at least six or seven years to discover that. Um, and once you start using maps, you start to discover all these wonderful different patterns. Uh, some of them climactic, some of them uh, doctrine, universally useful, some of them are context specific. So what happens is you see the environment change, um, you have to then look, work out, you, can you influence that pattern, is it universally useful across multiple value chains, or is it, uh, is it context specific? So maps actually help you learn the patterns themselves. It's all based on this strategy cycle. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, the most important thing is to observe the landscape. If you don't see the landscape, everything else is guesswork, I'm afraid. Um, if you do see the landscape, do remember that the more times you go around this cycle, the better you get at this. And uh, it's also important to act, because the, uh, it's, it's act through action that we actually learn. Now, all of this entire presentation can be summarized in the phrase, uh, crossing the river by feeding the stones by Deng Xiaoping, have a purpose and direction, small iterative steps, understand the landscape as you go. Right. It's all Creative Commons. Help yourself. Uh, that's the... Uh, uh, it's about a 600 page book. I, I promise people I will eventually finish it off. I'm just busy all the time. Um, so thank you. <laughs>